Welcome. Uh, my name is Manan Ahmed. I am a very proud member of the board of Asian American Writers Workshop. I'm also an associate professor of history, uh, South Asian history at Columbia University. Asian American Writers Workshop has been around since 1991 and it has provided an incredibly important space, both physical but also institutional, um, mental and intellectual for Asian American literature and counterculture. And it's provided a vital, I think, uh, avenue for radical conversations to take place and new communities to form. The conversation you're about to watch is part of our Radical Thinkers series. And this series today, we're going to be watching uh, two amazing scholars. One, Kaji Amin, who is a professor of women's gender and sexuality at Emory, and Rajiv Mohabir, who is a writer, poet, and translator. We developed this new series to place academics directly in conversation with trailblazing writers, poets, and artists. And our hope in putting together this series on radical thinkers was to nurture a dialogue that cuts across something called the ivory tower and something called the public sphere. We feel that the most important pressing and critical conversations that are happening within our lives as Asian Americans, but within the lives of our communities to which we belong, uh, does not need to be bifurcated through these um, rather um, curious and perhaps outdated um, divisions. In this series, we ask our radical thinkers to ask each other questions, to learn from each other's work, and to center revolutionary discourse by thinking about their writing and their scholarship, and to ultimately envision a radical new future. I hope that you enjoy this vital conversation between Kaji and Rajiv on queer theory and scholarship, the process of writing creative nonfiction and poetry, and their desire for expansiveness in naming the inadequacy of the term Asian American. I also want to say that this conversation comes after um, a, an incredibly upsetting um, event um, in Atlanta. And I want us to be um, aware of how our, our contemporary politics is increasingly centered around the demonization of Asian American lives and how conversations such as the radical thinkers, how intellectuals, artists, and academics like Kaji and Rajiv, and how organizations like AAWW are incredibly open resources for all of us as a community to come around and to center. And I wanna thank AAWW and its leadership for doing some amazing healing work in the aftermath of that massacre. I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. I learned an incredible amount for a minute, and I thank you all for being here. Hi, I'm here with Kaji Amin, who's an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Emory University and the author of Disturbing Attachments, Janae, Modern Pederasty and Queer History. I'm excited to engage him today in his uh, approach towards understanding a queer of color critique in queer studies. Um, he's also uh, working on a memoir project that I am going to draw questions out of him uh, from uh, eventually in, in this uh, chat that we have today. Great, and I'm here um, with Rashid Mohabir. 
it's my great pleasure and honor to be in dialogue with him um, about some of his writing projects. Um, Rajiv is the author of The Cowherd Son and The Taxidermist's Cut, two books of poetry, and has a forthcoming memoir that's coming out this June, um, I think it was June 22nd, is that correct? Yeah, so very excited about that, called Anti-Man. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we'll be, uh, I'll be engaging him um, with some questions about some of our mutual areas of interest. Wonderful. Um, is it all right if I start, Kaji? <laughs> I am dying to ask okay. you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I am dying to ask you this question. Um, okay. You know, in your in your book, in the introduction, you talk about uh, the fact that you arrived um, at a very different feeling about writing about Jean Genet as a kind of queer character or kind of existing in the, the space of queer mythology. Um, and, and this is when you started your research, you had an idea of what you wanted to, to kind of, you know, uh, draw out. And I'm curious about how that process felt for you as you relate to us, the reader, that that's not, that was no longer the project of this, of this book. Um, and I, I really, I really loved the idea of being at dis-ease or unease with your own kind of formulations of ideas. So if you could speak up to this. Thank you. That's such a wonderful question that really gets at the heart of what I was trying to do. And really, you know, I use that, I reflect on my changing feelings about the project um, and my changing approach to the project in the introduction, because I feel like it becomes really crucial to what the book is trying to do, um, because it's both about Genet and about his own attachments, um, disturbing, political, sexual, and otherwise, for instance, to prison, to the Black Panther Party, to the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And it's about um, the kinds of scholarly attachments that, that I think we queer studies scholars have to our objects and to our politics, right? And what exactly happens to those attachments that we bring to our work when, when we're confronted with the actual work, right? With, with my, in my case, the object of Jean Genet himself, who um, you know, ended up not living up to the expectations that I as a queer study scholar, queer studies practitioner was bringing to him. And, um, and I like to talk about this because I, I think that you know, scholarship is still kind of plagued by this idea of, uh, you know, even literary studies scholarship, even queer studies scholarship, by some of the remnants of um, Western scientific empiricism, this idea that we stand apart from our objects, that we are neutral observers who are documenting some truth about it, and, um, and that any feelings that we have about our objects don't enter into the experiment, so to speak, to use that, that language of empirical science, um, and they don't affect the experiment. And that's simply not true, but we don't talk enough about this um, when we talk about, you know, we have a lot of conversations about reading methods or theories, um, but we don't have enough conversations about um, the, the kinds of attachments that we as individuals bring, but the kind of attachments especially that I think whole scholarly fields have. Right. So that's part of my point. It's not just me as this particular individual who wanted certain things from Genet, but it's what um, what the field of queer studies would have wanted from Genet, you know, and what Genet doesn't quite give queer studies, right, as well as what he does give queer studies. So really, it's about um, trying, you know, attending to these attachments in terms of what they inform us about the field, right? Um, because I think there are lots of emotional dimensions to membership in a field of study that has um, political desires, right? And that's born out of certain historical pains, you know? Um, that, and, um, and when we don't acknowledge that, when we pretend like our methods are, and our analytics are transparent and, and neutral and, and simply correct, we, we lose that chance to learn about where the field comes from, right? Um, the specific histories it comes out of. But we also, I think, end up not doing justice to the object of study itself, right? Um, so it's really about this kind of attention to an object of study. And, um, and, and, a, and a, you know, it, it's beginning, it's getting me started on asking a series of questions of why in some cases, I think in many cases, literary scholars, and, and in particular, theoretically inclined literary scholars can overread or you know, pretend to get something out of a text that really was something that they knew they were looking for all along. 
right? Or that's coming from them or from the field or from their political desires rather than from the text itself. So, um, so I mean, I could go on for a long time because I feel like it's a big problem and something that I really want to get us um, talking about more. You that's know, I think, I think there's a kind of honesty, you know, in some cases that, that more creative um, writers or memoir writers are more able to have, you know, um, through the authorial voice, for instance, than, um, than, than scholarly writers, you know, because of this kind of dissociative practice of scholarship of like, the object is there and I'm here. That definitely doesn't seem like the approach to your scholarly text, though. Um, and, and that one of the great pleasures that I, uh, you know, felt as I was reading it was, you know, the 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 thinking through what it means and the implications of queer studies on, you know, queer of color critique specifically, and the, the engagement that uh, you have with, um, you know, people who have come before, whether concerning time, it concerns queer time, as well as kind of like the psychic imbuement of the word queer, which harkens back to a coalitional politics from the 90s. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this for me, and maybe this is because like as a poet, I'm, I think of things as in terms of like love letters. Um, how I feel is your book is a love letter to queer studies in that it's a, a massive calling in to redefine the, the kind of velocity of the word queer. And, I, that, and that's something that I, I think about a lot in my own writing about what is queer exactly, you know, in terms of methodology approach, is it somehow liberationist as you, as you, as you mentioned? And I'm wondering if you could uh, talk, tell me, I, Tell me a little bit about this because I'm so fascinated by this idea. Yeah, yeah, that's that's such a great question again, and um, and I think this is one of the 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 real I don't know um, productive difficulties within the field of queer studies, which is that the term queer um, can mean so many things. It can mean you know to the point where it can mean just about everything sometimes, um, but it doesn't mean just about everything, and that's because. Um, I argue there's a certain history of feelings and attachments behind queer that determine why it gets oriented in scholarship towards some things and not others, right? So what I'm saying is, you know, if you take certain definitions of queer literally, right, um, queer can be anything non-normative, but non-normative is just in definition, uh, in, in contradistinction to any given norm, right? There are so many different norms that we could take into account here, whether they're white middle-class norms, whether they're immigrant norms, norms, right? Um, whether they're scholarly norms in terms of method and discipline. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that, or, or even like, you know, say queer nightlife norms, right? Um, and, and I think that that starts to, to get us into a bit of trouble, right? Because there's queerness everywhere by that definition, right? Um, queerness is relational to some set of norms, but there are so many hetero heterogeneous overlapping and contradictory norms um, under play here. And I think one thing that happens in a lot of queer of color critique is that, um, or that threatens to happen, is that the, the norm gets defined as whiteness or certain US liberal imaginaries or um, you know, certain dominant, even dominant forms of time that are associated with whiteness and with Western, um, Western ideals of progress and such and, and so on, right? And then, and therefore, um, everything that is of color becomes therefore queer, right? Um, and I think that, that, you know, part of this is kind of in response to, to this, um, this problem where, um, say, in, in the West in general, um, the cultures of black and brown people have been painted as homophobic and anti-queer, right? Um, so it's kind of a response to that where you say, well, you know, if you take the dominant to be actually whiteness, um, certain formations of middle-class whiteness or whatever, right? Then all of brown culture, all of immigrant culture, all of black culture is queer. Um, well, sure, but what does that do? That reinstates the dominant um, and the point of reference as you know, white middle class American liberalism, whatever you know, um, it recenters that. And B, it it kind of it makes brown, black, and brown and immigrant cultures. Um, it almost takes away their heterogeneity, right? It's like they're all queer. Well, yes, but <laughs> you know, there's also homophobia. There's also patriarchy. There's also um, multiple different um, way, you know, there's forms of internalized racism and racism toward other black and brown groups, right? 
Um, and those complexities all disappear when the main referent is dominant white culture, right? Um, and, in contrast to which everything black or brown is defined as queer, right? So I think, you know, that's just an example of some of the thorny problems that you get into when you start playing around defining queer as this and that and the other, right? Um, and so, so I think part of my, my book is really asking some hard questions about this. I think for queer studies, you know, part of the way that it's been defined as, as different from an identitarian field, like, uh, you know, like women, well, Women's studies is also trying to move away from that, right? Um, but like, you know, Black studies or Asian American studies or something like that is by saying, well, queer is undefined. You know, it can be so many things. It can, it has something to do with sexuality, but it doesn't just have to be about sexuality, right? It can be about anything. Um, and so that's given a tremendous amount of energy to the field. But the way that I think that it's controlled this kind of huge expansion of what queer can mean is by saying, okay, it can mean everything, but this everything is going to be uh, going to be things that are necessarily politically progressive, world enlarging, you know, um, and and that open the way towards um, because there's always some dimension of sexuality, pleasure, etc. So more more that open the way towards more pleasure, like more sociality, you know, more togetherness, and um, and and so that's how it says, you know, the queer whatever it's going to be essentially is going to be a good thing. And, um, and so my book really pushes back on that by saying, well, you know, if you study queer historically, that's definitely not the case, right? Um, and I think that's true that if you study queer in any kind of uh, minoritarian culture, um, and even if you're not looking at queer specifically, that's also not the case. Like we don't do, we actually don't do justice to minoritarian cultures when we expect everything they produce to be good, right? Whether they're queer cultures or, or cultures of color. So um, so I'm trying to, to, you know, kind of to, to either, um, hold back this massive expansion of definitions of queer or to say, okay, well, if you want it that way, then you can take queer through wherever it's going, but then you have to map out the things that queer do does that are not so good in, in, along with the things that are good. So I talk about pederasty, for instance, this extremely common, um, you know, up through much of the 20th century, male same-sex form where there was age differentiation um, or even, you know, where there was a man with a youth or a man with a child, right? Um, like extremely common, much more so than, than has been acknowledged in, in a lot of queer studies. And, um, and I make, you know, there are all these aspects of pederasty that were queer, right? It was illegal for one thing um, when it was between a minor and, and an adult, right? Um, and therefore non-normative, but at the same time, it, it foils those simple def, um, binaries of normative versus non-normative, and, um, and it puts us face to face with a kind of um, politics and ethics that, though it might not be fully bad, abusive, you know, all the things we vilify pedophilia, for instance, for being, is also most definitely not going to fulfill all the, the political and ethical ambitions of queer studies, right? So basically I'm saying, you know, you can either narrow your definition of queer and keep it to queer sexuality and gender, right, uh, more narrowly, or you can expand it. Um, but if you expand it, you know, really either way, you're going to have to, if you're going to take, take seriously social and cultural life, you're going to have to map out the things about queer that are not only um, good and radical and progressive, but also ambivalent or even directly, you know, violent, abusive, etc. This totally enlivens, and thank you, because I, what I think what you've kind of performed for me in like verbally just now was um, an attachment genealogy um, of the word queer. And I really like thinking about that. This is an approach. I I am dumbfounded as it relates to also the heuristic of um, uh, de, de idealization, excuse me, and how they work together to kind of position our unease to illuminate the kind of possibilities of the, the things that are not necessarily, uh, you know, looked at or studied, like where are the multiple studies of pedophilia or pederasty, as you ask. Um, and uh, I think that's really, really interesting. And I was wondering if you could, I don't know if I, if, if, if it's all right, if I ask you about your methodology, because um, the way that you kind of show for us in chapter one, the ways in which you unpack 
<clears throat> the history of it, um, you know, it was really, it really kind of gave me an idea of thinking about sitting with unease as somebody and how letting that affective response actually guide, um, you know, scholarly inquiry. That's fantastic to me. I'm um, sitting here. I mean, in 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 writing, like uh, for me, it's it's usually those moments that I don't really understand, or <clears throat> the moments that are particularly difficult for me that I find that I write into to find answers in myself. But the engagement is a little bit different with um, attachment genealogy. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great, and thank you so much for for using it to reflect on your own writing process, because I think that that there's something really rich in in literature, right? Because literature is complex. It's never as fully idealizing as I think some scholarship is. So it's complex. I mean, in its in its affective range, right? Um, it's uh, you know, I think you find a lot of ambivalence. You find a lot of unease. You find a lot of complexity um, within literature. Um, and sometimes, and, and I think that, you know, part of what I'm saying about being attentive to one's objects is making, making space for all that complexity as, um, as a reader, right, and as a, as a scholarly critic, rather than trying to shape it into a kind of heroic narrative um, of what, you know, of, of a certain ideal of, say, queer coalition or, or whatever it might be, you know. And I, and, and, you know, as an aside, I'll say that I do feel like since I've wrote, written the book, either because of the, the kind of interdisciplinary expansion of queer studies as a field, um, or maybe because a few people have read my book, um, I, I do feel like queer scholarship has gotten less idealizing. You know, there, there's still that trend there, right? Um, but I think that scholars have, uh, scholars that have published books in, in the recent couple of years have been more likely um, to, to attend, right, to these complexities. Um, so, so thank you for, for pointing that out, you know, uh, or pointing out how unease sometimes functions in your own um, writing practice. But, um, but yeah, I think that that part of my methodology, as you're pointing out, was affective, right? It was about saying, okay, here, you know, I, I think that for me, my experience, especially as a junior um, scholar, you know, now I'm a senior scholar because I have tenure, <laughs> but when I was a junior scholar, I, I was trying to write, you know, queer studies scholarship. And so I realized that there was a kind of affective method going on, um, which is to say that I'd read a lot of queer studies scholarship and I knew how, you know, based on that, how I was supposed to feel <laughs> about various different things. You know, I was supposed to be against this, that, and the other, and I was supposed to, you know, look with hope towards certain things, right? Which are, diff are di is a different, you know, set of uh, relations than in the dominant culture, right? So like, you know, extreme dirty sex, for instance, is something that I'm supposed to look at with hope as a side of, you know, the unfolding of certain queer possibilities, right? Um, so this is to say that I just kind of absorbed all these emotional reflexes and orientations, right? And, um, and then when I turned to my own work, I would read about Janae or think about his, um, biography in terms of his political practices and, and things like that and think, well, this is really interesting. You know, here's where I expect to see something, you know, I hear an echo um, or I feel, you know, a, a kind of match, a resonance um, with some of these queer structures of feeling that I have picked up um, as a queer person living in the world and also as a queer studies practitioner and reader, right? And so I would say, well, these are the parts that are queer. These are the parts that I'm going to write about. And I would expect them to open up and, you know, and show me what I was looking for in them, you know, these sets of, of queer expectations that I had. Um, and I think part of this was about working on one author for an entire book that I had to really sit with all of his complexities instead of say, writing about one exciting thing about him and then leaving, you know, um, leaving the rest. Um, I had to really take all these complexities into account. And, uh, and the more I did that, the more I realized that, that there was a certain unease and that there's a set of, of ways that, that in scholarship that you can deal with it, right? Um, so one way is to acknowledge it, to kind of put it to the side and then to move forward with the better parts, you, you know? Um, you know, the kind of responsible, well, I acknowledge that he wasn't perfect, but nevertheless, let's focus on this thing. Um, another, you know, might've been to get rid, you know, to stop working on Janae entirely, right? And then another is to turn it into some kind of heroic uh, progress narrative, you know, like some like there's a bump in the road, which is racial fetishism, for instance, but then look, you know, he, he resolves that 
through activism, um, you know, on behalf of the Black Panthers and the Palestinians, for instance. And so, so I wanted to really think about, you know, well, what if I, instead of doing these moves, I honed in, you know, I focused in on those moments of, of unease to see actually what they um, informed us about. And, uh, and I end up proposing that, that focusing in on these experiences of, of scholarly unease um, can, inf can tell us a lot about why the field expects what it expects, you know, what histories drive that. Um, so for instance, histories of 1990s AIDS activism, you know, I think all these things have influenced the field of queer studies more than it tends to admit because it has been such a theoretically driven field rather than one that talks about its own history and its historical underpinnings. So I've tried to bring it back to, to this history um, through noticing these moments of unease, which is basically a moment where something doesn't fit that history, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and so seeing what that reveals about where the expectations of the field come from and how an object diverges from those expectations, which I found often had a lot to do with race, with geography and with history, right? So all these as, you know, aspects that dis, uh, diverge from a certain place where queer studies emerged, right? Um, and, you know, and from a location, basically. Um, so really it's, I try to use unease as a roadmap for a type of queer studies scholarship that wouldn't begin in the 1990s in the United States, right? In pre predominantly white, but not exclusively white communities, the way that queer studies did, right? Um, so so a, a guide for a kind of um, non-Western or queer of color or um, historically oriented um, queer scholarship. Yeah, thank you. I think the focus on Janae for the book, I think that's a really smart move um, in that there's like a parallel um, with what you posit for kind of like the future of queer studies, how it's important also to consider um, you know, the particularities, as you say, you're standing in like, okay, well, if we're gonna look at queer studies, we have to look at every single thing. Focusing on one person specifically, um, you know, it's taking the complexities and relations into that kind of account that you're talking about in that system of relations that queernesses are or queerness exists in the world. And I, I think that, that uh, it really exploded for me when I was coming up to the to, to that final kind of point that you have here about, you know, in the kind of like an envoy to, to, to the reader to be like, uh, can I, can I quote, can I quote you? Is that okay? Yeah, um, yeah, I would love that. Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> you say, my argument to be clear is not that queer studies needs to confine itself either to the historical time and place of queer or to the object of same-sex sexuality. To the contrary, I'm arguing that any redeployment of queer outside its narrow context of emergence that keeps queer's affective histories intact, seeking, for instance, to preserve the convergence of same-sex sexuality, political urgency, and radical transgression, is unwittingly reinscribing its 1990s U.S. origin story. Um, uh, and, and it goes on. I, I, there's so many. There's so many gems in this book, um, but I think like this particular. Um, uh, phraseology, what you say here, really drives home that kind of parallel for me in thinking about unease um, and how we can carry that into, um, you know, examination of historical things that don't serve like a grander narrative of, you know, kind of like the liberation politics of mm -hmm. 90s queer, um, which is, you know, definitely I was a uh, uh, coming up in the late 90s, early knots. And so like, I have this idea of what queerness is too around the activism and kind of um, the upsetting of the normative. And then thinking about, well, why is it that as a brown body, I didn't necessarily fit into what the right kind of queer to be was. And like queering the queer in the global North when you're, you're, you're you have tendrils in the global South is, is really, um, it's, it's incredibly validating first and foremost to read. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, it kind of, um, you know, it, I, I have this kind of gut punch, um, you know, where you're quoting um, Anjali Arandekar and Gita Bakel, who says, uh, you know, there's a tendency for uh, queer scholarship to mine the global South for examples rather than epistemologies. Mm. Um, and I think this is, this is, uh, you're, I, I feel as though queer studies just, you know, as I've understood it and I've studied, uh, you know, what little I have studied has been, you know, dominated by the, the global north and this just opens up 
let's call it discursive universes for yeah. understanding the relations between folks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that really does point to what my vision for what I want the field to be, um, which is, you know, this, this really multidisciplinary, multi-sided field, right? And I think that in order to do so, you know, to really open up queer studies to um, the global South, right? And to, um, to queer of color um, experiences, histories, epistemologies, feelings, et cetera. Um, there's, there's, well, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for that to happen, right? But one, one thing is, um, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about how, how theory tends to be, uh, especially, you know, tends to be associated with um, whiteness in the West in, in the academy, right? And, um, and I think Aranda Kar and Patel were, were just so, that's, it's so important what they noted there about how the global South tends to be mined for examples rather than epistemologies and theory, epistemology, knowledge, et cetera, is seen as, as that which emerges from the global North and, and especially, you know, the white Western global North. Um, and, uh, and I think that we're, we haven't, finished um, in the academy with that old kind of um, white Western universalism. I think it now takes the guise of theory, the idea that, you know, you study a bunch of phenomena, that Western phenomena, right, and then you create a theory based on that, and that theory, unlike theories that might emerge from the global south or other, you know, particular locations, that theory has purchase, right? It's it can be it's portable. It can be used in different locations. Um, it's universal, right? Um, you know, we don't call it universal anymore. We just call it theory, right? So I, I become very suspicious of how theory, um, a lot of the times, not always, but sometimes operates as a cover for a new form of universalism, and um, and I think it's really disappointing when that universalism goes by the name queer or trans, right? Um, so, so I think that, you know, part of um, what I'm really, one thing that I'm really enthusiastic about is um, trying to cultivate a kind of academia where, um, you know, where, where work from the work on the global south, for instance, uh, work on other geographies can be seen as not, um, not just, you know, empiricism, although I think empiricism is super important, right? Um, so so not, not to say that empiricism is not important, but that it can generate important insights for scholars working on all areas, right? That it can make the leap to the conceptual, right? Um, that that it has significance, right? That, that has reach, right? Um, I don't think that any of those things, significance, reach, you know, um, theory should be confined to the global north or, or to um, to phenomena that emanate from whiteness, right? So that's one part of it, you know, epistemology is, you know, rather than, than just examples. Um, but the other part of it, and I think this is addressed to queer studies specifically, is that I think doing that kind of work is going to have to, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Doing that kind of work is is going to have to um, involve um, opening the way to different feelings of what it means to be queer, right? Um, you know, this this set of expectations of queerness that come from that 1990s moment that both you and I were familiar with, even if you know we were a little late on the on the line. Um, you know, that might not be what it feels to like to be queer and brown. You know, even at the same historical moment. It might not be what it feels like to be trans right now, you know, um, and and I think that that's important. We have to we have to start attending to and cultivating and 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 uh, and diversifying these structures of feeling of what it means to be queer. And I think that's part of the the interesting and important work that literature and po poetry could do as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I was, I, you know, and like to the, the, the other thing that I was thinking about uh, when you were answering this was, yeah, what are what are the implications for writers, do you think, in terms of, you know, being, uh, you know, as I said, being connected somehow, whether it is as a, a migrant or, um, you know, immigrant or somebody with close connections to the global south, right? What then? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I have I have some questions for you that might that might touch on that and allow you to unfold some of what you think in relation to that. But um, 
I don't know if we should do that now or continue with your line of questioning. Yeah, sure, sure. Because I want to actually transition into talking about your um, your creative nonfiction work as well. So maybe this would be a good kind of segue. Yeah, 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 that's fantastic. So now, you know, so I'll turn to you. Um, yeah, I was thinking as I was reading, you know, and first of all, let me say thank you for sharing Antiman with me. And it was such a privilege and such a pleasure really to be able to, to read it um, before its publication, I felt very special. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and it's very, you know, it's beautifully written, it's very moving, um, you know, and, uh, and I think one of the things that I was writing, what, that I was thinking about as I was reading it was, um, was maybe what you might call a set of queer of color tropes, right? Um, that that are familiar. You know, I think part of the memoir form is is that play between familiarity and uh, uniqueness, right? Um, so you know, tropes like the return to the homeland and, and all the feelings about that. Um, tropes like feeling undesirable, um, feeling unrecognized. You know, you talk at one point about feeling unrecognizable as queer, and you know feeling like you had to behave a certain way, smile a certain way to not be seen as a terrorist, you know, when really you felt like a flaming fag. Um, and uh, um, queerness as, uh, you know, experiencing queerness as this threat to family bonds, which has um, a lot of, you know, a particular valence and a, particularly, a particular purchase for, uh, for brown folks and for, for folks with diasporic or, or migrant families, um, you know, which means losing that uh, connection, potentially, right? Losing that connection to tradition um, and to, you know, this, this feeling of, of familiarity in a, in a culture that is otherwise often hostile and unfamiliar, right? Um, so there are all these, uh, you know, the, the trope of, of uh, brown on brown love and sex and, you know, everything that that can mean. Um, particularly with, um, with other people um, with some connection to, to the subcontinent. Um, and, and so I, I think that all of those tropes are, are recognizable and familiar and like, you know, feel a certain way to, to other queer of color readers. Oh, also the, the, the model minority trope, the idea of disappointing one's parents through being queer, but also through not becoming a doctor, for instance. Um, so, so all those things, are very moving, but at the same time, I feel feel like there there are there are a few curveballs that your memoir throws in, um, and I was interested in how some of those have to do with the the really complex history of multiple migrations in your family, right, and the specific history of indentureship, right, um, such that the homeland is not just um, India but also Guyana, right, um, and there's this kind of double homeland, but also along with that a double or, you know, maybe even a triple colonialism, if you think of the, the United States and Canada, um, and, and all the specific uh, forms of kind of internalized um, oppression or internalized self-hatred that comes from those multiple forms of colonialism. So I, I thought I'd just ask you to reflect a little bit on, you know, what do you feel like um, your memoir is doing in terms of queer of color tropes and, uh, and the, the kind of twists on them? So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this question. These, this is so incredibly thoughtful, the reading that you have uh, of this. And I think that uh, when I think about the book and when I think about after, and, and this is a realization that only came afterwards, right? I mean, I think I was just following my kind of subconscious mind as I was going through it. Um, and I, I noticed that another queer character uh, you know, is my grandmother, is the Aji character. And just the way she exists in a different time, in a different kind of like relation to words even, um, who was unlettered in any language, um, but was, you know, this repository of great um, you know, epic poetry, which is something that totally astounded me and, and my family and how that otherness in her language was some place where as somebody who felt outside felt deeply held, despite my not always 100% understanding what she was saying. Um, and I think this speaks to that idea of the multiple migrations and the way that histories fold on each other, and then plus the racialized the patterns of racialization in the United States. So the other kind of like South Asian person in the United States that I become super duper close to is uh, a transnational adoptee 
um, you know, from Kolkata into the United States by a white family and how it's kind of like anotherness that exists before I have this kind of, um, you know, in into a kind of Caribbean culture in New York City as I make that migration again from Florida. Going to India was something that, uh, you know, all, all of our lives we were told, oh, we're East Indian Guyanese, or East Indian, or East Indian. I don't, I didn't know what that meant. I'm only East Indian in Guyana. <laughs> you know, I am read in the United States as Indian and in India also read as Indian. So V.S. Naipaul has this uh, a book called An Area of Darkness. And Yes, I, Paul, I mean, we can say everything that we can about him. Um, and one of the, the one of the particular, particularly horrible things, like uh, is in one of his essays where he writes about going to his dad's village in India and how he met with um, poor folks and how the, the way that he wrote them was this way of like, this is my family, I claim them, but they're poor, I'm glad we were colonized. Complicated because, you know, I can't, you know, I don't think, in, in Vidya Naipaul's case, I don't think that there's a way for me to say that, um, you know, his migration to Trinidad wasn't good as he became a literary gene, giant or, or, or what have you, but his writing of the people that he came from was deeply upsetting. So I also, in my memoir, I go to an ancestral village on my, my mom's father's ancestral village, but, uh, you know, and this is, I couldn't have, I couldn't have written a better fiction story that uh, you know, my encounter with these people who claimed me so dearly as their family were not actually relations to me, um, which was, you know, uh, it, it, it was upsetting that kind of trope of the return, I hope, uh, in that there's kind of like a, the, the belonging I had to look elsewhere. You know, it wasn't in those consanguine relationships that most people think about when they think of home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I, I definitely wanted to write about these kinds of uh, sexual encounters that I've had with people in a way that uh, it was only something that, in, I, that I could have dreamt about as a younger Rajiv, that when it actually happened, it was indelibly marked in my memory as being such. Um, but there was like a, the fulfillment of actual communication was something that was deferred until I came to poetry, which was, the most, you know, um, what would you call it, uh, ancestral of the, the the ties that I had. Another thing that I'll that I'll mention um, in terms of the outsideness um, is that uh, when my grandmother was uh, told that I was queer, gay, um, you know, first of all, my cousins and I would laugh like she wouldn't know what that meant. Participating in this kind of like colonial attitude of what what is expected, how we can be in the world. When she did have an idea of what it meant and how my family would react, my extended family, uh, her, their reactions, her, um, her statement uh, was the same in all of the kind of like imagined realities that I kind of like speculate on, um, which was you can't stop rivers from running. And I really, I really, that's something that feels really, uh, uh, kind of like opening to me. Yeah, wow, that's so beautiful. Um, I'm glad you mentioned your, your Aji as another queer figure in the text. Um, you know, your text, and I, um, I totally agree with you that about both of those ways that, that your text disrupts some of the, the, um, the, the expectations of the queer of color narrative, right? That the return to the homeland, um, you know, and, and it's really lovely how you set up that return. You know, you're, you're studying, you're looking forward to it. Um, you have this intense desire to, to know more about your family's history, um, to, to find those who sing songs like your Aji. And, um, and the, the, it's just gripping the story of how you, you, you are taken to that village and you're welcomed with open arms. <laughs> and then it turns out not to be your family. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I was unsure about to what extent we should be aware of, of spoilers in this conversation. So I'm glad that you, you brought that up, but I'm gonna follow your lead and, and try to not give anything else away. But yeah, it's a narrative that that um, opens with your Aji and ends with your Aji in terms of her funeral. And, um, and you know, you have some pretty difficult reactions to your queerness from, from other family members, but there's a sense that you have this close bond with, with your Aji, right? And it's partly because of 
her occupying this this very strange and as you mentioned queer position both in the family and you know and in North America um, speaking a different language and um, even from from her descendants right um, and but being able to communicate with you through song right and and I think that's so beautiful and um, and I think it really also casts uh, a different light on the two volumes of poetry that that you produced right that there is this this connection to, to your Aji um, through them, and uh, and also a connection to, to much longer histories, you know, of indentureship, right? But also um, in India itself, um, and and the way that these histories travel and change through song, right? You know, it's it's an element of a kind of oral tradition um, in which stories, songs, you know, epic poetry can take on different meanings to different people in different places at different moments in history, right? Um, so, so I guess, you know, one of my questions is about how, how, um, how your writing, both in your memoir and in your uh, poetry, deals with, um, with song, you know, the, the similarities between poetry and song, right? Um, and the, the relationship between song and oral traditions that actually transform through these multiple migrations, right? Um, so that's one of my questions. And then I also have a question, another question about your Aji after this. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, uh, yeah, it's my firm belief or my, my expressed desire to think about my poetry as kind of transposing the music of this kind of folk culture that I, that I my, my grandmother and grandparents definitely grew up in and my parents grew up in, in to, to, to some extent I as well, um, into American poetry. And that American poetry needs to be unsettled in terms of its language and its cadence and its rhythm. Uh, one of the, the, the very specific kind of things that I've done is if you see in um, The Cowherd Sun, the section breaks are actually uh, quarter note rest symbols from Western musical tradition to show in a heavy handed way the connections that I'm trying to make. Uh, there's also a kind of deep musical tradition, um, you know, inside of uh, ghazal performance, which either in the Calvary Center have a ghazal, but it's not too, too many. Uh, there is also a kind of uh, prolepsis, if you will, of a new kind of form of poem that I'm working through, which is I'm calling a Chutney poem, based on, uh, you know, there was a singer from 1960s, uh, 1970s Trinidad, who, um, sang the song Kaise Bani. So when we were earlier on the call, when all of a sudden the music started playing, yeah. that was actually his song ah. that was playing. And so it's funny that like, I maybe this is kind of uh, the, having all kinds of technological problems today. But uh, one of the cool things was, is that was a reminder to me like in this like other kind of way to talk about this is that um, the Chutney poem is based on the Chutney song. So I've, I've kind of migrated this form into the United States to be, um, to be necessarily complicated. So the chorus, the, the, the chorus, which is the first couplet, has to be written in Guyanese Hindi, Guyanese Bhojpuri that my grandmother spoke. It also has to include elements of Creole, like Guyanese Creole, and standard English. And so, you know, there are a lot of great thinkers who talk about uh, Caribbean nation language or languages, uh, English, uh, de English derived languages that are now functional as Creoles and Patois in the Caribbean, like existing this in, in this new kind of like phonological structure that allows for um, a completely different poetic stake um, in its utterance. And this has been so integral to my understanding of, you know, how poetry works for me in my life, and specifically in the Cowherd Sun with cadences. And in Antiman, I, in the, in the, one of the organizing pr principles of Antiman, because it's so, um, as a hybrid text, it kind of jumps here and there, and hopefully it's upsetting in that way, or maybe it's profoundly like, uh, uh, nurturing, I don't know. Um, but there's a thread of a song that my grandmother sings that I translate into English section by section until the very end. What I do is I have my grandmother sing the song. I, I, my, my, my grandmother sings the song. Then um, what's written is an actual transcription of the way that she would have translated it to me, of, or how she did translate it to me, I should say, and followed by my own translation of her translation in the form that mimics the original. So there's a kind of going in and out of poetics that happens there, which I'm hoping like on some kind of like metaphysical, spiritual soul level, there's a, a an actual mediation of through that kind of linguistic journey 
that the reader can see, if not understand. Mm. Wow, that's really beautiful. Thanks for that, that explanation. Yeah. Um, wow, so much to think about. So uh, I'll just make a side comment about your Aji before going on. Um, uh, then this is just anecdotal, but in my own life and, and in the lives of some people I'm close to um, who are queers of color, or trans people of color, um, there, there's, there's actually some similar stories of like a difficult relationship with either one or both parents, um, but a very strong bond with a grandmother figure. So, so I think that there might be something to be said for thinking the figure of the, the brown grandmother, you know, who comes from elsewhere, who lives elsewhere, um, and the the kind of the kind of special queer bond that that can be had uh, between her and a grandchild. Um, in my case, when I told my my mother, my Puerto Rican mother, you know, my, my dad is Malaysian, I told my mother that that I was trans and and she said that she didn't want me to come to her house. Um, to visit her for, for years after that, and that she didn't want to have anything to do with communicating that to her family uh, because they would disapprove. Um, and so, so a little bit later, I you know, communicated it to, to her extended family myself, who I hadn't seen in a while because, um, because I guess I had assumed that they would be like her. Um, and they all lived in Puerto Rico. She lived in Texas. And, um, and they actually were completely different from her, in particular my abuela, um, and who you know, welcomed me with open arms. But more than that, like very easily actually put me in the, the role of the Puerto Rican grandson um, and seemed to really enjoy that, that practice with me. Um, so so um, yeah, I think, I think there's something to, to be said about that. You know, just throwing that out there for other folks to think about later. And um, but going back to what you were saying about poetry and, and song, um, and the way that I think the intense affective meanings that it can have, the way that it's relational, say between your algae and you, and you can come back to it, she can translate it, you can translate it, and it can be done as a kind of iterative process. Um, I, I thought that was so beautiful. And I also wanted to ask you to think about that in relationship to Hindu myth, um, which is another thing that that you know that that appears. Um, and that seems really significant to you, but in your, your memoir, you talk a little bit about how the significance of it um, differs geographically, right? It means a very different thing in India than it did in a kind of Guyanese context, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's like, so I felt like a little subtle um, in that, like, I am hoping that, uh, you know, to avoid these, um, these conservative Hindu bigots who will try to like, you know, use Hindu mythology to kind of prove whatever end they, they have. And so for yeah. uh, what you're saying specifically for me is um, the practice of Hinduism in my family can have the velocity of the anti-colonial. Now like, hear me out. <laughs> I'm talking about plantation Hinduism that evolved from mm -hmm. South Asian Hinduism in the, 18, in the late 1800s to something that is syncretic and new um, that doesn't exist in the same way temples that are, you know, Guyanese Hindu temples now are being infiltrated by the conservative right-wing um, mm -hmm. RSS and uh, uh, Vishwa Hindu Parishad of America um, to, to get kind of whatever diasporic dollars that they can get. And so that's the kind of like nation project or, or the, the, the nation building um, with Hinduism that I completely disavow. However, um, the fact of uh, in the face of such uh, cruel colonization um, that my, 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 all of my grandparents had, or except three of my grandparents had uh, connections to Hinduism. For them, it represented survival. And there are so many metaphors that were available to us that I want to mine. Um, and like one of the things I, I want to be careful about in my, in my writing is that um, I don't think that uh, th th there's a poem based on the, uh, the, the Karnataka, Karnataka Raga called Ardhanarishwar Raga. And Ardhanarishwar is the god uh, Shiva, half Shiva, half Parvati. So, the, you know, there's this kind of uh, thing that has been claimed in queer studies as, uh, you know, probably trying to be necessarily allowing space for queerness. Because then, you know, you have these conservative people who are like, oh, Hinduism allowed for queernesses, you know, for millennia in this kind of depoliticizing way that, um, you know, queers of uh, color in who are minoritized and racialized in the global North and in other spaces, in other global South spaces even, um, have looked to it as for, for possible liberation. Um, one of my, one of my, my, my great inspirations is 
um, the, dra the, the drag queen Sundari, the Indian goddess, who is, um, you know, uh, who is Muslim but performs as Lord Krishna. And I think that the performance of this, in an interview that I had with her, she was telling me that um, it was, in fact, through this possibility of some kind of liberation that she approached it to. And I was like, oh, this feels so resonant with me in the way that I kind of think about, um, you know, uh, these kinds of mythologies and queernesses um, and what they allow for me. Um, I, uh, and it's a problematic, and I am uh, going to take a, a page out of your book and allow myself to not have an answer for it and to allow myself to be uneasy with it. And, you know, hopefully that'll launch me into further exploration. But speaking of further exploration, I am also happy to read your creative nonfiction as well. Um, I've read uh, uh, two pieces of yours. Um, the first one, uh, and, the, and these are from the, 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 the collection that you're working on called Brown Trans Misfit. Um, and the first one that I wrote, that I read about this, let me pull this up really quickly. Gender is for grownups. Oh my goodness. This is so, um, and I, I feel really honored that you, you let me read this. Um, as you know, you're saying that, uh, or that you've said that you've only recently let, um, you know, cis folks into understanding uh, 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 trans childhood stories. And I, I'm, I'm really, really happy about this um, or, or grateful to you for this. Um, and so with that, I'm not going to venture too much into to talking about th these, these uh, situations that you write about, but I will say there's some, there's some things that recur. One of the, the kind of like recurrences here is around genre. Um, and I'm wondering about, you know, you say that you are not an experimental writer and you say this again and again, but as I'm reading this, I'm like, huh, what does that mean? Because I am seeing experiment on the word level on the like, um, affective level, um, this feels like really risky writing to me, and I'm compelled by it. And I, and I was just wondering to, I, w I was wondering about your thoughts about genre, about linearity, about fragmentation. Um, are these friends of the queer writer? Um, and then what about, yeah, and how, how, I'll ask you that, I'll ask you a follow-up question, follow-up question to this too. So. Okay, yeah, no, these are, these are great questions. And, um, and they really speak to what I'm trying to do in this memoir. And, and first of all, let me say, I'm, it's, it's such an honor for me to have you know, such a beautiful writer and poet as you, you know, read some of my, my creative nonfiction because I really am stepping out of the scholarly genre that I'm comfortable with here. And it feels very vulnerable in a lot of ways. So, so I'm very honored by that. And as you mentioned, um, you know, part, there's a, the section that I'm thinking of starting with is actually about trans shame. And it talks about how, um, how difficult it has been for me to, to speak about transness to cis people at all, right? Um, to the point of being stealth in, in a lot of my life, though not all of it. And, um, and I think that part of this book was an exercise to try to make transness something that was not, or, or my experience of transness, something that was not incommunicable, right? And something that didn't cut me off from the world, but rather was offered as a way of, uh, a, a particular means of relating to it, right? Um, so it's been a kind of therapeutic process trying to write this. Um, and it's been, in a lot of ways, a difficult process rather than a pleasurable process. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, I want to write about myself because I'm so special and I have so many things that I want to tell people about my experience. It was really the opposite of that, that I really didn't want to tell anyone about my experience, um, even informally, people close to me. So it was a really difficult exercise of trying to, to breach that. Um, and uh, and so, it, so it is, it does feel to me to be a risky and vulnerable um, way of writing. And I think one of the, um, you know, you, you asked about, fragmentation and non-linearity and things like that and whether those are queer forms. And um, and I think, I guess the, the answer for me is like, maybe, <laughs> you know, I think that that I actually have, have co-edited a special issue of the ASAP journal on queer form with um, Amber Jamila Musser and Roy Perez. And one thing that we argue in that introduction is that, um, and it particularly has to do with the reception of work by, um, queer artists of color, queer writers of color, as being about sociological content rather than about form. 
right? And so we're trying to say that, that we need to do away with this kind of form and content divide or the, the prizing of content um, when it comes to minority authors. Um, so because I think a lot of authors, you know, such as yourself are actually saying something really important um, about brown queer experience through form, right? I think what you said about trying to change the cadence of American poetry, right? With the, these, uh, these Guyanese Creole song, Hindi songs um, is, is really important. You know, it's about poetry feeling different, differently that way. Um, but, um, but at the same time, I think that there's a way that that in queer studies, sometimes we say, oh, okay, well, here's the norm. It's like the linear autobiography. So anything that deviates from that is queer, right? And, uh, and I think sometimes queer artists have good reason to take up genres, right? Um, or forms and use them um, in particular ways. So, I, so I'm not, I don't wanna make a divide, right? And say that experimental is queer, non-experimental is not queer. I think queer authors and queer of color authors can use different forms and different experimentation um, for different purposes, right? For me, I think it, that the real adversary in writing this memoir is the genre of trans memoir itself because of its long connections to um, to the medicalization of transness, right? Trans people have had to tell their life stories and it's been part of the process of being diagnosed as, as being worthy of gender affirmative treatment. Um, so story is uh, narrative, you know, is tied to diagnosis and to the medical apparatus when it comes to trans people. And, um, and we see this even in more informal cases like, you know, when I was growing up, talk shows or things like that, where trans people had to defend themselves for being trans or explain why they're trans or think, you know, documentaries, you know, and, um, and, and I think the structure of trans um, autobiographical narrative is such that it's always aimed at a cis audience and it's always has the purpose of explaining how, how it's possible that somebody can be trans, um, you know, both of which are extremely transphobic. Um, so, so trying to write a trans memoir against those presumptions um, is really difficult. And I think calls for some kinds of experiments, um, you know, requires some kinds of experiments with form. And, um, and one thing that I'm trying to figure out, you know, as I continue writing this is that, um, you know, there, there are certain things like, there are certain things that I resent, <laughs> right? In terms of the, the, um, the white cis expectations of say a brown trans narrative, right? And one of them is a kind of dramatic story of coming out to family, you know, being disowned or something like that, right? And, um, and, you know, and I think that, you know, in your memoir, you approach this really beautifully and there's a kind of central moment where, where there's a kind of traumatic, if, you know, I mean, I'm using that word. I don't know if that's the word you would use. There's an, affectively intense um, encounter with family. And then it, it's followed by a series of, of ex, I would say literary experiments, right? There's like three different alternative endings to this story with family. And then um, I forget what you would call it, the, the Amazonian dolphin <laughs> thing. Um, and, and something about that feels very powerful, right? If you had just resumed in the voice of like memoir narrative where you left off, it wouldn't have felt as powerful, right? There's something about that, that, um, that formal fragmentation and the turn towards different modes of writing that communicates something very profound there. Um, but, but at any rate, in my own writing, you know, I felt very resentful of that, that kind of expectation. And, um, and that's led me to, to avoid certain stories that, that have to do with family, right? So I think it, it's also about me kind of playing a game with the, with the cis reader um, and, and trying to withhold certain things from them but at other times be really radically honest with them. Um, so, so it is you know, about affect in, in that way as well. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on the kind of like psychic imbument of this notion of genre. And I love what you're saying about like genre and content, what is the divide um, and the expectations of like a white cis readership um, for trans uh, memoir. Um, you know, in Genders for Grownups, you, you talk about form directly and you say, if I can quote you, um, and it's so beautifully rendered. The, the genre of memoir similarly has been about suturing continuity to change. It asks you to recount the events, both external and most importantly, internal, that led you to become the person you are today. 
It is once again about selecting and weaving together stories to recreate a narrative of change as progress, maturation, culmination, a narrative that satisfies, a narrative that makes sense. Jay Prosser claims that trans autobiography can heal the painful wounds in transsexual experience, stitching together a healing continuity out of, a, uh, out of the brutal cuts of before and after, integrating a past that need not be lost after all. To put it simply, one use of trans memoir writing or storytelling or therapy for those who don't write is to make yourself feel whole again, sane again, to fill the gaps of childhood and adolescence lost, to fabulate one that can feel like your own. I understand all too deeply the felt need for this, but at what cost gendered continuity? Particularly for those like me, whose discon discontinuous childhoods, rough with loose threads named diaspora, colonialism, sexuality, race, and place, need a good bit of brushing before they can be rewoven into the linear narrative of transsexuality. Um, and that is so well thought out. Um, and I was wondering if this is attached to your idea of kind of like time in, in memoir because of the three, the, uh, of the two pieces that I've, I've read, um, uh, there, there, seems, there, there seems to be a kind of uh, temporal binding, um, you know, that kind of the, has the, the, the chapters hanging together in, 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 in a way that, you know, formally works quite well with the return of the cockroach at the end, let's say, of the, 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 the second chapter, which is called uh, Brown Trans Alien. And what a great, what a great title for a chapter. Um, <laughs> And I, the, the way that you move through layering story onto, you know, this hideous creature at the end, um, I had all of, it had all of these like powerful resonances for me emotionally as I wrote it. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, about this, um, you know, can you, can you imagine being queer, uh, that time is a genre to be queer in? instead of too queer, so to speak? Mm, right, right. That's such a great question. And, you know, it just so happens that in the first issue of Transgender Studies Quarterly, um, it ended up being a, a keywords special issue. And so people wrote about different keywords. And the keyword that I wrote about was trans, was temporality. And so, um, so a lot of people cite that when they want to talk about trans temporality. And I, I wanted temporality you know, I put that forward because I wanted to think, A, about just kind of the quotidian, quotidian experience of a lot of trans existences in which, um, in which for all sorts of reasons, um, there is not this kind of linear temporality moving towards maturation, right? You know, just to cite just one well-known example, you know, among, among trans folks, transition, you know, even late in life is often experienced as a second adolescence or as a return to a childhood that one never had. Um, and, uh, and, and it sometimes becomes really difficult for trans people to, to create a story or to tell a story of their lives that encompasses being another gender, being seen as another gender, um, or that under, you know, that, that makes sense of that. And I, part of what I'm highlighting in, in this part, you know, in one of the chapters that you read is how difficult that is for me, you know, not just because, you know, it's, it's vulnerable or whatever, but in some cases, I literally can't remember what it felt like to be a girl. And I don't know, you know, and uh, yeah, and I, there are all these ways in which I'm tempted to, to just read my childhood as a boy's childhood, um, but I don't actually know if that's true or if it's just what I want to see, right? So it's something about the opacity of my own childhood, even to myself. Like there are many different ways I could narrate it and I could, you know, there are ways that feel easier and more satisfying and safer to me, um, but I'm not sure that they're true. And, you know, even after writing that chapter, I'm not sure what is true. And so that that's why I felt like a certain, you know, there was a need for a certain um, somewhat experimental style of writing um, for all these reasons that have to do with real difficulty in trying to figure out continuity, which is the project of memoir, and, and trying to write against 
the the idea of a transsexual narr narrative in which you tell the story of the past only to, to certify why you have a right to be trans in the present, right? Um, yeah, so so there's there's that. Um, um, I forget. <laughs> I forget what it is. The other thing that I wanted to say, um, but yeah, thanks for, for that question. I I lost track of what we were talking. Oh. About. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no, you absolutely did. I was thinking okay. about time too, and the, the way you answered it was perfect. Because now um, I like to also there was a kind of uh, thing that you had said here about the use of the word transsexual as mm -hmm. opposed to any other terms, and you say that it's like dressed up in Western. Oh God. Sexology. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so I was wondering about what does it mean? I mean, because of uh, taking that word and, you know, in, in for its, uh, the, the, the narrator here talks about taking that word and using it because of its uh, specific meanings. Um, how do you feel that will interact? Or how do you feel, or what is your hope, I guess, for the kind of afterlife? or not the afterlife that when, as this goes out into people who are, you know, cis, what are, what are the expectations or what, what do you, what is your hope? I think is my, the, the better way to phrase this. Yeah, well, that's actually a really hard question um, because I don't know, like a lot of this was an exercise for myself, you know? And, um, and in that way, I think it's different than how I hear a lot of people talking about their, um, their creative writing projects where they're really thinking about an audience, a press, you know, and um, and I, I, um, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, figure out a way of articulating that just in order to, you know, sell the project to a press. Um, but I really, you know, to be honest, the way I wrote it was really for myself, um, both in order to deal with this bind of like you know, of transness having become something, um, and brown transness in particular, you know, having become something that felt like it was incommunicable and not a grounds for relation at all, right? Um, I wanted to question that within myself and also try to think of a way to, to write out of it. And I, and also um, my own resentment at the way that, that trans speech has been so constrained by, um, by the binds of transphobia, right? So that, um, you know, I think the binds of transphobia make it virtually impossible to tell a true story about being trans, um, even to oneself, right? Um, so, so I think that, that, you know, it was a real exercise in trying to, to, to write about those binds from within them, but also open a space for thinking about what, what, you know, what might lie beyond them and, and outside of them, and if it, it's possible to create a space for that in language. Um, and so, so that's the project of the text. And, you know, and there are moments when there, there are a few moments when I address cis readers and when, and there are certainly moments when I talk about the expectations that are placed on trans narratives by, by cis readers and, and the, the limitation, the way that they're limited by transphobia. And, um, but, but the text isn't actually written to cis readers in the way that I would say a lot of, um, which isn't to say that I don't want to or expect to have a cis audience, but, um, but I think there's a way that a lot of trans narratives, um, even those that are just like interviews, right, um, are addressed to cis people in that they try to explain trans um, experience in a language that would make sense to cis people and that would lead, and, and always with the implicit um, call that like, okay, you know, you should be able to understand this because some aspects of this are like you, right? Um, and so I'm not, I want to write without doing that and without also without having that kind of explanation um, already offered, right? Um, I want aspects of it to be difficult and opaque to, to cis readers because I think it should be. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really important in order to keep the kind of the psyche of or the, the, as you call it, the soul, the trans soul kind of in its uh, uh, universe, I think, in a way that is like meaningful for the text itself and for the readers that will find it and be incredibly moved um, by your beautiful writing. Um, I, I kind of want to like ask you, <laughs> this is like, this is an unfair question. And of course I'm happy with no um, clear answers. But uh, what are, what is the relationship for you? Because you talk about how it's like a different kind of uh, uh, movement for you in thinking and writing um, between this kind of scholarly, this profound scholarly engagement uh, 
with um, you know affect theory um, and this uh, affective memoir that you are writing, but just in a different kind of an incredibly different genre. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are the experiences for you? The joys and the not so joyful bits of it. Right, right. No, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but yeah, I think that that part. Well, one of the things that I'm trying to do is to not, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of a lot of the, the bits of my memoir do try to zero in on these experiences of unease instead of turning away from them, or the parts where transness becomes opaque, right? It doesn't have a clear explanation and, and it's not located in any clear, you know, um, grounding in my childhood, for instance. Um, you know, I, I think especially that chapter on childhood really performs that by saying, you know, here's the narrative that I would want to tell. Here's the narrative that I do tell when I do tell a narrative. And here's why it might not be true. You know, here's some other narratives that could just as well be told, right? Um, narratives that don't feel good or comfortable to me, but that might be equally true. Um, so I think that I was trying to put you know, in writing that, there was, I was trying to put something about my book into practice, which was not um, not going with the story that felt easy or that felt right. You know, because I think that that um, there's so much at play and so much at stake um, when you're telling a trans narrative, and so what feels right in an affective sense, just like what felt right when I was, um, what felt good when I was turning towards what is queer about Janae in that initial moment um, is not just because it is right, right? It's because it's a whole set of cultural expectations and a whole set of like, um, you know, claims that you're throwing at the cis reader that make it feel right, right? So you actually have to, you know, you can, you can talk about that, but if there's something that feels difficult, that feels off, that feels shameful, right? That feels hard to admit, you know, that's where you really need to, to center, that's what you really need to center in on and kind of unfold and expose. So kind of what you were talking about in terms of writing into the unease and only learning what it means through that process. Um, I think that says, a, you know, that speaks a lot to my own process of, of doing this kind of writing. Um, but also in, in, you know, not related to affect theory, um, one reason that I wrote that I started writing this because you know I'm also working on a scholarly project um, that you know is kind of on trans history um, is that I was looking for things that had not been said you know and um, and I realized that you know maybe I could have gone and, and looked for bits of them in this or that interview with a trans person or this or that recently published literary piece. But I was like, actually, I'm looking for something, you know, I don't think that's the way one should go about scholarly research, right? And say, I know this about trans experience, and now I'm reading all these things to try to find the thing that I already know, right? I think you should read looking for what you, looking to be surprised, right? So I was like, you know, what I want to do is actually try to put the thing out in the world that I know to be true, but that I don't see in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really got me thinking about how genre functions in academia, because there's actually a lot of creative work that goes into producing theory, for instance, or producing theoretical readings of pieces of literature, but we're not really allowed as academics to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to do a piece of creative writing, and these are my thoughts, you know, there actually isn't any evidence for them, I'm just giving you my thoughts and experiences, you have to locate it in an object or in evidence and then pretend that, that that's where it's coming out of. And so I wanted to say, you know, um, I don't want to pretend, I don't want to play the scholarly game. You know, I want to actually produce something that reflects what I know, you know? So it was it was also an effort to do that, to, to kind of call to that knowledge. But actually now I want to turn the question around on you and ask what brought you to memoir, you know, after writing such beautiful and, and uh, successful books of poetry. And, you know, I think we've already discussed how song and poetry, you know, comes into your memoir. So there's definitely a clear um, continuity there. Um, but, but why, what um, influenced the turn to memoir for you? Uh, yeah, well, thank you for your answer and this question too. Um, it's not a it's not a lovely answer. <laughs> um, so, uh, as my first book of poems is being published, uh, a mentor of mine, Rigoberto Gonzalez, um, who is a writer, a critic, um, and a poet himself, 
a beautiful writer, poet, critic, um, told me, you know, there's a reality to you living um, far from the continental United States. I was in Hawaii at the time. Um, and he's like, you know, you, as your first book is coming out, people are gonna wanna know a little bit more about you. He's like, there's not many people from your community writing poetry and you know, publishing in the United States. So you kind of have to think about what are you going to be doing? And so I was like, oh, okay. So it started out as maybe writing an essay about, okay, I'll publish this um, in, a, in an online magazine so that there'll be some bearing on my poetry. So it was always in service of my poetry. Not till I had written maybe five pieces that I realized, oh, actually I'm doing something deeper here. Yeah. Let me see what it would feel like to put things together and to work into it. Um, and I remember, I remember Rigoberto also saying to me, he said that some stories are too big for poems. Mm. And I thought about that and it haunted me. It haunted me for a good while um, until now it makes, it makes sense to me. There's so much more that I want to do in space, <laughs> using the space of the page that I would be able to do in prose. Um, you know, the, the kind of metaphor that I like to use is that poetry is like standing in a house. I'm, I'm, in, I'm standing in the upstairs of a house. You, Kaji, are walking on the street and I call out to you, come find me. So you enter the house and you listen to my voice and you follow my voice to where I am. And that's how we meet. Writing nonfiction or writing prose is more like, I call to you on the street, I open the door, I take you by the hand and I go room to room. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of, that's the, the, the difference for me. Um, and it's, it's I, I don't, I, 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 I started it thinking that I wouldn't find it pleasurable or joyful or exciting, but oh my, that has changed dramatically for me in that I do actually, love writing prose, as well as poetry, of course. Yeah. Wow, what a beautiful story and metaphor. Well, um, I think we're running out of time, but I think there's one more thing that we should talk about, which is the, the inadequacy of the term Asian American, right? I think that, that your book really demonstrates how, um, well, I think many people talk about how South Asian is excluded from that formulation, you know, even Southeast Asian in some ways, um, but, you know, something like Indo-Caribbean, you know, it becomes virtually illegible. So, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, truly. It's like, you know, I've been thinking of it as a kind of um, intellectual community that I have like part-time belonging in. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm using like the Puar's uh, metaphor of um, an assemblage of identity, it's mm -hmm. one of the, it's one of the bundles that I hold um, uh, that I can like pick up for, you know, thinking about conversations to be had about racialized subjects in the United States. Uh, it's also something that is alienating because to say that I am, you know, Asian American disavows a kind of um, mediation through my, my hugely syncretic culture, which includes Afro-Caribbean food, music, language, everything. Um, and, I, 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 and I know that Asian American is used expensively or can be used expensively, but that's not typically how it's used in practice. In, in, in practice. Um, uh, and so it doesn't necessarily, it, it, it allows for some complications, but not full pictures. And it goes back to, 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 um, to what you're saying, to what you had said um, about, you know, allowing for a greater, uh, a greater uh, universe of realities um, that exist in the world. And so thinking about Asian American and thinking about Asian American Pacific Islander, if South Asians are excluded, then Pacific Islanders don't exist in this appellation to in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander term. Um, but yeah, how about you? How, where are, where do you see the limits for yourself? Um, as yeah. an race then, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think uh, I think for, for myself, it's similar. Um, and, you know, it really resonated with me, the part of your memoir when you were talking of, about growing up in, in Florida as the only brown family in this area. You know, I grew up in Texas um, in a very white and, and racist area as well. Um, and where I was really racially illegible, according to those logics. Um, and and being mixed race, you know, I had a Puerto Rican mother, um, I had a Malaysian father who at that point had returned to Malaysia. And, uh, and 
And the whole thing, we, we also didn't even really follow, like in terms of my own narrative tropes, like the tropes of the model minority Asian American in some ways, in some ways applied to me, but in some ways didn't because my mom had already come from a middle-class family. So moving to the US was not about class mobility for her. It was because my dad didn't speak Spanish. Um, and uh, and they never pushed me to become a doctor, an engineer or anything like that. They were kind of happy with, with whatever I did. Um, but, um, but yeah, there was something about that racial illegibility. There's something about the, the way that Malaysia doesn't show up at all in the American racial imaginary, right? I mean, it has a really interesting history in the colonial imaginary as the place, you know, a place of savage Asians, Borneo, right? A land of headhunters and pirates. And so, which really doesn't fit the whole idea of, of like Asian American civilization, you know, as, as, a, as a civilization that, that, um, that Europeans had to kind of contend with and orientalize in order to control. Um, so, so it's a really kind of off-center narrative that, or history of, of Asian Americanness. Um, and then when you combine it with, with Puerto Rican, um, you know, it makes it even more complex. So in some ways I feel like, you know, Filipinos um, who are Asian, but also tropical and also um, colonized by the Spanish, um, and, uh, and sometimes Muslim, you know, um, in some ways I see, I see myself as having a lot in common with them, as well as, you know, um, Indo-Caribbeans, because there's something very illegible about that combination of Asian and Caribbean or Asian and Spanish colonization, right? Like that really doesn't fit the, the tropes of Asianness in the United States. So for me, it's been, um, you know, it's resulted in both a sense of alienation, like I can't be a part of I'm not a part of anything, at least not wholly, but also a sense of like promiscuous uh, proximity. Like I, I, on the other hand, you know, I'm similar in some way to a great many people. So it has that kind of double-sidedness. Well, great. Yeah, it's been so lovely to talk to you about your work. I'm so, I'm so excited um, by all of your ideas and by all of your writing. And I'm really excited to see what you do with your memoir and um, do keep me in mind um, for uh, if you if you need reader a reader to test oh my um, gosh well, thank your you memoir so out on because I'm wow. compelled and I can't wait to know what else happens so yeah yeah well thank you Rajiv like this was really such a treat you know I, I feel like we could go on just chatting forever and that would be a pleasure.